Hello and, hello and welcome to uh, this lunch hour lecture. Um, very pleased to introduce Valerie, Valerie Curran, who um, today is going to talk. She's from the um, Clinical um, Psychopharmacology Unit here at UCL. And she's going to talk on um, the subject that I think is on the screen. Cannabis, two, pleasure, two. madness, and medicine. So over to you. Ah, wait one moment. <laughs> okay, thank you very Maybe much, two. and thank you for coming. Um, there's never been a more exciting time to be interested in cannabis. It's a completely different drug than it was uh, 15 years ago. So the, uh, the older people here will, uh, will, will, would not recognize it as being the same drug they might have come across at university. Um, it's exciting because there's global changes in legislation. More states in America now have medical marijuana than don't have. Um, Trudeau's just been elected in, uh, to Canada as president um, with one of his bandwagons being the legalization of cannabis. Um, it's, it's vision's changing in Europe. And also it's incredibly exciting that um, components of cannabis are now being developed as medicines for some disorders that we don't have available treatments for. So for all these reasons, it's, it's exciting. Um, so I'm going to be giving you a, a rapid tour around pleasure, madness, and medicine. Um, if you might think that we know roughly equal amounts about each of these, but if we look at the, the scientific research, there's been hardly any on pleasure. It's not been something that research councils have funded. Um, it's not something that politicians like to talk about. It's almost the elephant in the room when it comes to drugs, the idea of pleasure. We know a huge amount about what I've called here madness. Um, but it's more to do with the negative mental health effects that, that can derive for some vulnerable people from using cannabis. A huge amount of research has gone into this. And increasingly now, there's research on cannabis medicines, um, but not nearly as much as, as on the mental health effects. But clearly, you know, cannabis is associated with pleasure. Bob Marley would be very pleased now because this year the Rastafarians in Jamaica were given um, approval to grow as much of the weed as they liked. Um, so recognizing its spiritual context in, in his home state. Um, and of course in places like Colorado, Washington State, you can go into these places that look like enormous sweet shops and you can buy all sorts of cannabis preparation. So chocolate truffles are apparently a favorite if you're trying to find young kids finding what to get for granny for Christmas. Chocolate truffles laced with cannabis are a real favorite. And you can even get uh, lollipops. So the commercialization of cannabis on the capitalist model that's happening in some parts of America um, is very much based on the sort of pleasure idea. Um, and earlier this year, we did a program, Channel 4, 4 did a program about our research on cannabis. Um, and uh, this was Neil, who's a very charming man, who's a retired policeman. Who, um, he had, he'd actually been an undercover drugs detective. And this was about 9 o'clock on a wet Wednesday morning. And we just, through a vaporizer, administered him some nicely balanced cannabis. But much more focus has been on cannabis and madness. Basically, Richard Nixon, with the war, who initiated the war on drugs, um, pushed very much the line that all drugs were, were evil if they weren't tobacco or alcohol. Tobacco and alcohol were fine. Everything else is no good. Um, and there were even films like Reefer Madness and the portrayal of, of madness being associated um, with cannabis. So what does this madness mean? I mean, nowadays we'd refer to mental health, um, and there have really been two uh, areas that people have focused in on. Um, the first is the, the risk of psychosis. So that we, now, we know from epidemiological studies going way back that um, especially if people start smoking cannabis when they're in their 13, 14, 15 years of age, in adolescence, um, it increases their subsequent 
uh, risk of psychosis. Um, it also, if, if someone with a diagnosis of schizophrenia um, smokes cannabis, they're more likely to relapse. So if they're stabilized on their antipsychotic medication, that they're functioning well. If they then smoke cannabis, they're more likely to relapse into um, an acute episode. Uh, that proportionally affects a tiny percentage of people. The vast majority of people who smoke cannabis don't have psychosis. Um, and the, the majority of schizophrenics have never smoked cannabis. A much bigger problem um, that's, that we think has increased over the recent years is addiction. 9% um, of people who use cannabis will develop a dependence on the drug. And all these factors depend on certain vulnerability um, issues because it's only some people. I mean, we know that Prince Harry smoked cannabis and has no adverse effects. David Cameron has smoked can cannabis and has quite a good job as things go. Um, so it's, it's not that it's a direct consequence. You have to be vulnerable. And vulnerability to the negative effects of cannabis is conferred if the earlier age you start to use, how much you use, how regularly, and there are also environmental and genetic factors. So we've known about these for a while, but our research group um, were particularly interested in one thing that hadn't had much research on it. What about the type of cannabis you use? Um, well, cannabis in every language has lots and lots of different names. In fact, wherever I've given talks on cannabis, I've always looked up the local terms for it. And in every single country, there have been more words for cannabis than the Inuit or Eskimos have for snow. But what does it actually mean, all these, all these different words? Well, there are a lot of differences between uh, different types of cannabis. So cannabis, the plant, contains over 100 unique ingredients that no other plant contains. And we call these cannabinoids. So there are over 100 different cannabinoids. But there are two that, are really, that really stand out. The two most prominent, one is THC, tetrahydrocannabinol, and that's what makes people stoned. That's the, the active ingredient. It's what people want the effects of. But there's a very important other cannabinoid in cannabis, and that's called cannabidiol. And these two things, THC and CBD, are a bit like yin and yang. When they operate together, it seems to be more harmonious. And looking at them separately, they have almost opposite effects. So THC can make you anxious, temporarily, acutely, and produce temporary psychotic-like effects in healthy people. And THC, as you will know if you smoke the drug or take it in edible form, um, is hugely impairs your memory and ability to learn for a couple of hours after you've, you've smoked it. CBD, on the other hand, reduces anxiety, so it calms you down, it has, and I'll show you evidence of this in a minute, antipsychotic effects. So it acts against schizophrenia-type symptoms. And there's evidence that we and others have found uh, that it actually can improve your ability to remember and to learn. And we, in our first study with uh, Celia Morgan, who's done uh, most of the work with me, uh, we looked at people's hair, because in your hair, is a record of your drug use. So your hair grows about a centimeter a month um, and keeps in the follicle inside a record of all sorts of things to do with your diet and your drug use. You can even go back to mummies in Egypt and find traces of cannabis in their hair. It, it's like a permanent record. So if you take this lady perhaps here, would have, I could tell her drug use for the last three years. She's got quite long hair. Um, and so you can look at hair and not only say find cannabis, but you can actually look at levels of THC and CBD. So we did this in this study. Oh, I just put um, this lady up because 
Some people have been known, especially in the States, where they, they're te now using hair to drug test people. Uh, some people actually shave their heads before they can get samples for the police. So in this study, um, we had groups of young people, and we looked at their hair to see what the balance of THC and CBD was, if there, if there were any. And we had 20 people only had THC in their hair, 26 had CBD and THC, so the balance, and the majority, 86, had neither. And we used a measure of psychotic-like experiences and compared those three groups. And what we found was that um, unusual experiences, which are akin to hallucinations and delusions in uh, schizophrenia, were markedly increased only in the people who had only THC in their hair. So if they had no cannabis at all in their hair, they were fine. If they had THC only, they had some positive psychotic-like symptoms. But if they had THC and CBD, they were fine. They were like people with no um, cannabis at all. So this strongly suggested to us that CBD could protect people against the psychotic-like effects of THC. Uh, that was back in 2008, and it was really nice this year that a study came out really showing that this was definitely correct. Um, the study was by Marta De Forti at the Institute of Psychiatry, and what she did was she, she didn't measure cannabis at all, because she didn't have biological measures, but she did ask people with... Uh, psychosis, so people with a diagnosis of schizophrenia, and, um, and matched controls. And what she found was that those people who reported smoking skunk had three times the rate of psychosis compared to people who've never smoked cannabis. And interestingly, hash, a skunk is, skunk is cannabis that has no CBD in it, okay? It's just THC. Um, hash is traditionally balanced CBD and THC, and hash did not increase the risk of psychosis. So there's a harm reduction message there that I think you'll all get. Um, so if CBD can protect you against the psychotic-like effects of THC, could CBD then be used to, to treat schizophrenia? And this study was done by Marcus Leviker in uh, Mannheim in Germany, and what he did was he gave uh, one group of schizophrenics CBD for 28 days, and the other group amisulpiride, which is a traditional antipsychotic medication. And this curve is just showing the reduction in psychotic-like symptoms over the month. And you see both treatments uh, reduce symptoms uh, in the same way. But in terms of side effects, the, one of the worst side effects of antipsychotic schizophrenic medication is people put on lots and lots of weight. Um, so you see here, gamisulpiride, people put on about three and a half kilograms over the four weeks. Um, this didn't happen with CBD. All current antipsychotic drugs do this increase in weight. So it looks like it could be um, a promising treatment. But I want to turn now to a much more common problem, which is the problem of addiction. There are about 180 million cannabis users um, in the world. 9% of those will be addicted. And in Europe, a recent survey has shown that 1% of all adults and nearly 2% of 14 to 17-year-olds are addicted to cannabis. And cannabis is now uh, the second most common reason after heroin for young people going into drug treatment services. So it's a very different picture. If we'd looked at this 20 years ago, it would not have been like this. It's a recent thing. And this curve is showing you how much we've had an increase in skunk. That's cannabis that doesn't have any CBD in it. So it's either police, police seizures or community surveys analyzed for the amount of THC or CBD. And you can see it's really been shooting up since... Uh, the early 2000s. So what we've got is skunk essentially is getting rid of CBD 
and massively increasing the level of THC. It's a very different drug than it was before. And if you look at um, the number of young people with addiction problems going into treatment, this is over the, roughly the same period, the increase in skunk cannabis has been paralleled by an increase in 14 to 17 year olds needing treatment for cannabis addiction. And we asked, we had a, a large group of 420 uh, cannabis users who were 16 to 23 years of age, it's a group we work a lot with, and we asked them what type of cannabis they preferred. So they could either say no preference or a preference for herb or resin, which has lower THC um, and an increased CBD, or a preference for skunk, which is the high THC, uh, but no CBD, importantly. And this is what we found. These are all indexes of addiction. So here, it's a psychiatric classification, DSM, symptoms of cannabis dependence. The skunk, with no CBD in red, um, hugely more addiction problems in skunk users. Craving for cannabis, again, massively increased in people who use skunk, from preferred skunk. And the time it takes to smoke um, an eighth of an ounce, 3.5 grams of cannabis, again, people using skunk smoked their cannabis a lot faster than people who used other preparations. And this was a survey done by Tom Freeman and Adam Winstock as part of the Global um, Drug Survey, showing a very similar pattern. And it's looking at the relationship between how dependent, how addicted people were to the drug and what kind of, um, of preparation they were um, asked about. And these are all people who are familiar with all three types. And what they found um, was that it was only in the skunk users that there was a, a clear relationship between um, how often they used and how heavily addicted they were. And one of the, one of the effects of addiction um, to a substance, whatever it might be, is that that substance or pictures of it or cues associated with it uh, grab the person's attention is one of the kind of brain mechanisms, if you like, or psychological mechanisms, how drugs get, get to be so attention-grabbing. Um, and we know that's true of lots of drugs. And the degree to which someone's eyes move towards drug-related stimuli, you can measure it with eye movements, you can measure it, measure it with response times, um, is related to the degree to which they crave the drug when they haven't got it and the, the degree to which they are addicted. And you can measure this in a, a simple task. I imagine this is a, a laptop screen divided in two. So on one side, you have something that's related to the drug, in this case, cannabis. And on the other side, something visually similar but has no relationship to the drug. Um, and it's a very simple task. You just uh, ask the person to press an asterisk either on the left or the right-hand side um, as quickly as they can. So nothing to do with the pictures. So if you were actually looking at the drug there, you'd be very fast. If you're looking at the neutral stimulus, you'd be much slower because your eyes have got to move across the screen. Um, okay, and the same, it's all balanced for the other side. And we looked at this in a group of 94 young cannabis users, and we looked at it in terms of, um, we, we took a sample of the cannabis they'd smoked and had it analyzed by the Forensic Science Service so that we knew exactly what was in it in terms of the THC and CBD. And both groups showed an attentional bias towards cannabis when they were sober. But when they'd smoked their cannabis, what we found was that it was only the people who had very low CBD, so they were smoking skunk, that had an attentional bias towards the drug. Those uh, smoking hash or herbal um, with CBD in it, actually CBD reversed the attentional bias. It was almost like it was an antidote to the effects of THC. So in a way, CBD blocked that attentional bias.
and part of the brain that, that uh, attributes meaning to, uh, to information in the environment is called the brain salience network. Um, and it's basically, it guides people's attention towards things that are important, that matter to them. So for example, you might be a chocolate lover um, and you, your attention would go to the cake. You might be an Arsenal supporter. Again, the same salience network in the brain would, would focus you towards Arsenal players. Or you might be a cannabis user, and this would be more important for you. And we looked at this in cannabis users where they came on separate weeks, and they were either given skunk, the pure THC, which wasn't balanced, doesn't have any CBD in it, or we gave them the balance, the hash type, treatment, or we gave them the something that did nothing, smelt the same as cannabis, but didn't have anything active in it. And we give, we give people this uh, stuff through a volcano, because we don't want people to smoke uh, tobacco or have anything unhealthy. And we import the cannabis uh, from the medicinal cannabis used in Holland, because in the UK we don't have any medicinal cannabis. And what we found was that the salience network connectivity between the different areas of the brain was much reduced if you had the skunk-like preparation compared to the balanced one or placebo. So again, this is showing a disruption of connectivity in the, uh, an important network in the brain that's disrupted by THC, uh, as in skunk, but is restored by CBD, CBD acting as the antidote um, to rebalance the network in the brain. Now, interestingly, um, we also in that study asked people to rate how stoned they were at various points after we'd given the cannabis. We gave them two lots of cannabis to keep it going longer. Um, and what we found is very clear, as you can see. So the skunk is in red, the, the balance in green, and placebo in the blue. Both types of uh, cannabis made people equally stoned. So in terms of how stoned you get, which is the pleasure that people are looking for, then both types of cannabis are the same. It's only the THC that matters, the CBD doesn't. So there's no real pleasure gain smoking skunk compared to an, a, can, a, mix, a balanced cannabis that has CBD in it. Well, how does cannabis do all this to the brain? Well, basically, whether or not you've ever smoked cannabis, um, we all have cannabis receptors in our brains. So there are two types of cannabis receptors, CB1 and CB2. CB1 are mainly in the brain um, and probably very important for a lot of the mental health issues. Uh, CB2 receptors are mostly in our immune system. And that's why people are now looking at the relationship between these CB2 receptors and cancer, where you've got diseases of the immune system. So why would we have cannabis receptors? Why did God put cannabis receptors there? Yep. I mean, not so that we can go and smoke cannabis. We've, got, we've all got the receptors because there's a natural chemical in the brain, if you like, the brain's own cannabis. And the main one of these is called anandamide. And it's called anandamide because I think the scientist who discovered it in Israel probably smoked cannabis himself because ananda is Sanskrit for bliss. Um, and there's another one that's also um, in the brain, a natural chemical that acts on our cannabis receptors, which is called 2-AG. And one thing that we know CBD can do it's, it, it can boost anandamide by breaking down, um, by, by inhibiting the breakdown and its reuptake into, into brain cells. So that might be a mechanism by which we're finding these protective effects of CBD on THC. And the brain's own can I mean, we've learned so much about the brain from the drug, actually, which is very interesting because by giving the drug from outside, we can, let, we can manipulate the brain's own cannabis system. And the brain's own cannabis system is critically important in times of brain development. 
and an especially important one in adolescence when lots of changes are happening to the brain. I mean, adolescence is more about brain changes than it is about hormonal changes. We used to think it was all hormones. It's not. These, these areas of the brain are the frontal, prefrontal areas are developing rapidly in adolescence. And we've come to understand a lot more about how that works. And if you we think this is why, because of the changes that are happening, if you smoke cannabis in adolescence, it's going to have a much more impactful effect than later on. But how does cannabis dependence affect the brain's own natural cannabis system? Well, the, it's difficult to look at it. I mean, in animals, they, they can look at the brain directly. Uh, in humans, uh, we can only do brain imaging. Uh, we can't look directly in the same way. But what we can do is take, uh, do a lumbar pul puncture, so take cerebral spinal fluid, and we can look at the chemicals in that. And uh, Celia Morgan and our group did this um, a couple of years ago. And what we found was that the level of the brain's natural cannabis, if you like, anandamide, was um, significantly decreased in those people who used cannabis heavily, mostly daily. Okay, I would now want to come on to say a little bit about cannabis as a medicine. Um, it's been used for thousands and thousands of years as a medicine, um, especially in China and India. Um, and it was, it was used regularly here before the war on drugs. Queen Victoria famously um, used, used tincture of cannabis for her period pains and throughout her, her childbearing uh, times. And if you think about it, this plant that contains over 100 unique ingredients, these unique cannabinoids, could potentially be a real treasure ch chest of new medicines. But actually, we've had cannabis medicines for quite a long time. In the 1980s, THC, we gave it the name dronabinol, was used for people who had nausea when they were undergoing cancer treatment, um, it was used to stimulate appetites in people with late-stage AIDS. Um, and then in 2010, um, a spray called Sativex, which was a, a, an equal part of THC and CBD, became available for people with multiple cirrhosis to stop um, spa spasms, um, which often prevented them sleeping and caused an, an, an awful lot of problems. So these these cannabinoids are available as medicines here, but not the drug, not, not the plant. Okay, in the UK, cannabis is still in Schedule 1 of the Medicines Act, which means it has no recognized medical use at all. So it's very different from, you know, nowadays two-thirds of Americans can access medical marijuana, um, ca Canadians can, lot Several countries in Europe can, Uruguay, several South American countries can as well. Outside the UK, um, these are the main uses um, for cannabis. So that these are what the, you can get a doctor to prescribe you cannabis for in some countries. So pain and muscle spasm in multiple cirrhosis or spinal cord damage, uh, chronic neuropathic pain, which is... Um, sort of nerve cell pain, which is very, very difficult to treat otherwise. We've talked about nausea and vomiting. Um, glaucoma that doesn't respond to, to therapy. Sleep and anxiety um, are widely, uh, wide indications for medical marijuana. And in California, we've been uh, working with one prescribing place there, and we found that there are quite a few prescriptions for a completely new psychiatric disease we've never heard of before being in the medical books called writer's block. <coughs> and at the moment, um, there are current trials that are really exciting going on across the world. Schizophrenia, I've shown you one example of that Leverka study where CBD seems to be having a positive effect without having the horrible side effects of antipsychotic medication. Um, diabetes is a big one that's 
currently there are lots of trials going on, and cancer I've mentioned already in terms of those CB2 receptors being uh, pro prominent in the immune system. Um, childhood epilepsy, there are currently five trials going on in um, the States and, and one in Edinburgh. Um, and in a way, this was started by Charlotte Figge, her dad. She had Dravet syndrome, which is a horrible childhood epilepsy syndrome where you can have 300 fits a week. I mean, it's virtually uncontrollable and their life expectancy is not good. Well, her father was obviously a, an intelligent man who'd been reading up on cannabinoids. And he reasoned that CBD might actually um, help people with epilepsy. And he persuaded a, a farmer to grow him cannabis where there was very little THC, so the child wouldn't get stoned, but lots of CBD. And in fact, the growers decided to call the plant after Charlotte. They called it Charlotte's Web. Um, and it's got about 18% of CBD in. And at the last um, notification, Charlotte was down to one fit a week from around about 300. So people are very, very excited. Again, the, the trials haven't finished yet. Hopefully, there'll be um, data out towards the end of next year. But there are a lot of people with epilepsy now who are doing everything they can to get hold of CBD because the early results are very uh, exciting. So to conclude, um, cannabis addiction and psychosis risk are increased by the skunk high THC, no CBD strains of cannabis. CBD reduces THC's effect on attentional bias and on the brain's <coughs> salience network, um, but it doesn't affect how stoned you get. So there's no gain, really. If you want your THC, have it with CBD, and that can be protective. Cannabis may cause long-term changes to the brain's own cannabinoid system, um, and especially probably so when it's used in adolescence. <coughs> Medicinal cannab cannabinoids have huge potential. There's lots more of them I've only mentioned two, but there will be, you know, several others are being investigated. What does it mean for, for policy? Well, in a way, if we could control the market, you could promote higher CBD strains, you could tell people how much THC was in what they're getting. At the moment, you don't really know what you're getting unless you're, uh, you have access to sort of ways of analysing cannabis, and we don't have that unlike it in other countries, such as the Netherlands. But if you could control the market, you could also inform people about individual vulnerability factors of what kind of potential damage you would do if you had schizophrenia in the family, if you, had, um, if you were under 18 years of age. And it seems like the logical first step in the UK would be to take cannabis out of Schedule 1 and allow medical use here. So just for those doctors who feel it is appropriate, and a lot of patients who feel that it's their human right, if cannabis controls their pain and nothing else does, surely they should be allowed it. This is what they're arguing. Um, and taking cannabis out of Schedule 1 would also mean research was much easier. I mean, we could do research on cannabis because we have a home office license, but that costs us quite a lot of money, and we're inspected, and it's not that easy, um, whereas we can do anything on alcohol, nobody cares, you know. Um, so I think partly following the success of Trudeau in Canada, who was recently elected, the UK Liberal Party have now set up um, a working party on how they might legalise and go into the next election on that banner, because it clearly works for, for some politicians. And, um, and I co-wrote uh, with the House of Lords committee on um, working party on drug reform, um, the, the argument for, for making cannabis available as a medicine um, in this country is a first step, but the government didn't, don't want to move on it. Okay. So these are the wonderful team of people who do all the work, especially Celia Morgan, Tom Freeman. Um, and... Uh, you need more information. This is our website. We are running a, a clinical trial at the moment for a new treatment for cannabis addiction. So if you do any, know anyone who's affected, you might mention it um, to them. So thank you very much.
Thank you very much, Val, Valerie. We have um, well-timed. We've got uh, a certain amount of time for, for questions. Um, so now, two here, that one first, and we'll have that one second. Fascinating talk. There's obviously an awful lot of misinformation about. Is that um, thing that you wrote for the House of Lords available as, as a PDF on, on the net? I think it's available on the House of Lords website or something. Great. Yeah. Okay. I'm going to send it to my MP. Okay, um, thank you. <laughs> um, d um, the, I, I, I buy... Um, I, I, um, I've forgotten what it's called, but it's, it, it says it's got no drug in it. Those seeds, cannabis seeds, to put in my muesli in the morning, organic um, hemp. hemp, yeah. Hemp. Um, is that uh, completely useless, or is that good for us, or is it rubbish? <laughs> I think hemp oil is meant to be quite good for us. Um, there's not been a lot of research on it, but, there, but hemp isn't psychoactive. No, no, no. And have you done any assessments with older people, people over 60? Um, we haven't actually done any direct work with people over... Well, actually, some of the volunteers we had in the, the study that Channel 4 filmed were over 60, including John Snow, who had a very extreme reaction to it. Um, because they all say it's, this isn't cannabis like it used to be. It's not, uh, it's not, it's not stuff they used to uh, smoke. And actually, he interviewed David Cameron just before the election, and Cameron agreed. Next one was just here. Um. <clears throat> Hello. Hi. Um, yeah, in Parliament recently, they did debate um, cannabis being legalised, but only about five people turned up, so mm. I don't really think it was top of their list. Also, the CBD oil, um, medicinal oil, I found that it is available in this country. A couple of vendors online are selling so it seems to be legal, otherwise it wouldn't <laughs> be so. Yeah, potentially not. Um, but they say that it's very high CBD hemp oil and it <laughs> comes in a very kind of concentrated form, 10 mil. Yeah, no, I've, I've heard that there are some people in Harley Street selling it to people with, whose children have epilepsy. Um, but I think that it's a bit dodgy, is it? Do you guys know? Yeah, the psychoactive substances bill um, is not very helpful for research. <laughs> yeah. I think there's a question. Are oh, you another question? Sorry, one more yeah. question. Um, how do you think the changing attitudes towards cannabis, kind of more thinking about America, because they're obviously quite a lot further ahead than we are, um, paves the way for research on other psychedelics like uh, psilocybin and DMT? I think it can, it can only be helpful. I don't think it can be detrimental. Um, but there's certainly a sea change. It's partly linked to the fact that in the UK or in most of Europe, the big pharmaceutical companies have left. Yeah? There aren't many of them left working in, in Europe. Um, they've gone to China and India where it's cheaper and they can make more profit. Um, so what's happened is that people are, are now looking at existing drugs. So rather than hoping for new drugs to be developed for a lot of especially mental health problems, um, they're having a look at the older drugs, and it's partly the success of ketamine as an antidepressant. So here we've got another abused drug that is actually becoming a, a, a very positive medicine for people who have not responded to psychotherapy or any other antidepressant in their lives. Some of them are responding to ketamine. So I think that's really opened up uh, people's minds to maybe psilocybin and other uh, potential so-called abuse drugs, which you know, have an action on serotonin in the brain, like many of the prescribed drugs. Um, your brain doesn't know, the dif doesn't know what's the difference between a legal drug and an illegal drug. You know, if it can do something it positive, yeah. then... It sometimes informs the experience, though, if you think someone in a uniform is going <laughs> to the door. Well, exactly, <laughs> yeah. Thank you. I must apologize to people on the left-hand side of the auditorium, um, because we, we, we've really run out of time. I do apologize. Um, but uh, it all remains for me to thank um, uh, Valerie Curran very much indeed for a very interesting talk. Oh. Thank you very much. Sorry.